Another question, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, with what you just mentioned, that's actually kind of interesting because I know um, Paizo has been really successful with that. Like going to the conventions, everyone's excited to see what the next step in the story is, and um, just they want to see how the world progresses, and they're really interested in these adventures. Um, but uh, and it's interesting because you guys now have backing of you, know, you can do all this play testing and iteration, and you can uh, actually start doing this. Uh, you know, user experience design that uh, um, they might not have the resources for. It's actually really fascinating. Yeah, like I said, we, we, we're changing the way we think about things a little bit, and it's going to be an ongoing process for us. So we're, I mean, we're having to learn even still now, right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah, it's going to be a process. Yeah. And I think one of the, the, the sort of like goals we put in, like, you know, the stakes, you know, the, you know, having clear goals was we wanted to have products that if you weren't playing D&D yet, you could still understand what's going on. So there's this funny thing we were looking at. Uh, we used to, Wiz, Wizard used to do this game called Dreamblade. And I was comparing this ad we did for Dreamblade versus how we sell our games today. And the Dreamblade ad was incomprehensible unless you already played Dreamblade. Because it talked all about the mechanics. Like, here's this new mechanic and this new faction, this new, a new way to roll the dice. Where now it's much more like, you know, the Tyranny of Dragons, right? Oh, Tiamat, the Queen of Evil Dragons, is invading the world. Even if you don't play D&D yet, like that sentence makes sense to you. All you need is a basic knowledge of, of fantasy. So a lot of it is also kind of getting in touch with that. What can we do to cast a wider net so we're not just selling to people who are already playing the game? So. Oh, question over here. Uh, what's the design process like for creating a character class from the ground up? Just nothing starting out but a, a title. How do you guys approach that? Well, um, we didn't really have to do that for fifth because they all come from existing classes, yeah. right? Um, I, so, speaking, I, I can't speak to like we're going to create something totally new right now because we haven't really done that in the last three years. But um, so for the classes, though, uh, we typically start by asking the question: Who wants to play this class, right? Like, who is this class for? Who is this going to appeal to? What are they looking for out of this class? What are like not just story-wise, but also mechanically, and then gameplay experience-wise. So, you know, we look at like the the bard, for example, tend to be appealing to people who like to play more social characters because they're more social classes, right? Uh, so we look at who is this for, and then we try to figure out how we make that person happy, right? And so we sort of construct a an ideal player profile for that class. And so we start asking questions like, how are we going to make that person happy? Um, so as that's happening, along the same time, we're designing the mechanics to make that person happy, and we're sort of thinking about like, okay, how have we done in other classes? Um, there's not like a scientific process though, right? And that, that's the thing is uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing really uh, on the player side with like classes and races and stuff like that. There's no like uh, mystic formula that produces them, right? So I was gonna do, I think one of the things if we did a new character class would be what's the hook that's gonna make people go, I wanna play that. Yeah. So I think back when Shadowrun, I don't know if anyone's played this, it's this like cyberpunk game with magic. In 1989, when I saw that game on the shelf, there was on the cover a, uh, an elf, a woman in a trench coat with a shotgun casting a spell. And I knew immediately I wanted to play this game because that looked awesome, right? Like, and so a lot of it, I think, is like, who is this person in the world? You know, if we're making a new class or a new subclass, who is this character? And why would people, and to some Rodney's point, why would people want to play this person? You know, why would you want to be this person? And I think for us, the way the system is set up now, for D&D as opposed to a new role-playing game, uh, since we already have our existing classes, probably our big question would be, is this a subtype of an existing character class? Or can this type of character have so many archetypes beneath it that it would demand a new character class? And I think in a lot of cases going forward, what you'd see us do is say, well, this is actually someone who can fit in this character class, and we'll make this new subtype, you know, things like that. That, you know, really using the world, and that just that really good hook factor of, well, is this something you, someone you'd want to be? Does this look, look exciting? Can you picture that one visual that you'll create that will make people go, I want to be that person? And I think that's a really good starting point because you're speaking a language that's more visceral rather than to say, well, the difference between the boomerang master and the, you know, the shot put master is the die type they use or a mechanic. It's more, here's this person's story. You know, the, uh, so it's almost like you're creating, when you're creating the class, you're creating who is the uber representative of this class and is that someone you want to be? I mean, that's kind of the... Yeah, I think that's great. Any more questions? Or, oh, wait, back here. 
No, that, that's a, and the D, D, the D and D culture is a maker culture, so it's a very natural fit. Right, right. We Hasbro. I'm going to forget the name of the company. Which is bad. I know this. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Hasbro is actually has an as a has a licensing agreement with a company that does uh, 3D printing, where its users can upload models and then sell them, and you get a cut. It's I can't remember the name of it though. We j I think they just announced maybe a couple weeks ago that D and D's part of that. Yeah. We haven't rolled anything out yet, but yeah, it's definitely stuff, and it's definitely. I mean, we don't have anything to announce. But that is definitely a big part of D and D. Is and just getting like the figures for your uh, your game are like extremely difficult and like are kind of cost prohibitive too, just to get like the right ones. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I mean, uh, those things are like not very they're very short lived too. I think I've rolled them out for like I don't know maybe less than a year and they were all like disappeared. I'm sure they don't like very the prop party for Well, it, it's a great example because like you know with the the, the character miniatures. We have to guess what do people want to play. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing it more like you maybe have someone who can sculpt it, or is just listening to players, or is in the you know, you can do that, and it's kind of it's it's nice it's the cycle it takes care of itself. Well, it helps boost the fantasy a little bit exactly. like, instead of having these random things that I just have on like my my paper mat, you know, even downloading other people's mats and having instructions for hey, if you print this on vinyl, then it'll be like perfect to go. Like would be sort of you know, yeah, no, exactly. User generated content, obviously, in, in, in video games, is a big thing. And it's always been part of D&D. &D. Yeah. So, and I, I mean, that's where I started, right? That's where Rodney started. Yep. So, yeah, it's definitely something we really support. And so we can't announce anything, but it's definitely something we want to do and we're looking at, so. Give us the tools to make you more money. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> do we have another question? I thought I sent another hand out there right here. So I, I have a final question, like a jokey final question, but I don't want to force it to wrap up. OK, is there anyone else have a question before we? Oh, one question over here. Yes, I have one. Uh, what is some of the plot process that goes behind the monster CR? Because okay. I don't know, yeah, okay. I don't know which numbers and what it's supposed to represent, but I don't know the actual process behind those numbers. So I, I'll give you the briefer version of it, because I could probably do an entire hour-long talk on, on the math behind the game, uh, behind monsters alone. So effectively, what we do is we break it down into uh, a monster's offensive strength and its defensive strength, right? And that's a combination of accuracy and damage for attacks, and then of course uh, AC and hit points for defense. And then that also, all like the features and special attacks and legendary actions, those all feed into those. So we do things like, um, for example, if a monster has regeneration, we say, how long is this monster typically going to live? Okay, add three rounds worth of its regeneration to uh, its hit points for the purposes of figuring out how tough it is. And so then what we do is we, we figured out some sort of baseline numbers for like how difficult a monster is, like a, a first level monster, uh, a CR1 monster, how difficult is it, and that's all derived from our average player numbers, which we calculate based on the design of the player stuff, right? So we've got this CR1 baseline, and then we say, okay, compared to the CR1 baseline, how much tougher is this monster offensively, and how much tougher is this monster defensively? And then we figure out, okay, well, it's 10 times more difficult offensively, so that'd be like CR10 offense, and then it's only five times defensively, so that's CR5, and then we kind of average those together. This is the extremely oversimplified way of me explaining this because it's actually uh, a very complicated Excel spreadsheet that I designed that does all this for me, um, but that's sort of the, the gist behind it. And so 
for a lot of things, it's pretty simple. It's just looking at like, okay, what impact does this have on the numbers, right? So like, okay, this guy can cast shield every round. His AC is actually five higher than it is, right? Or um, this guy uh, has a legendary action that he can use to make an attack off turn. Well, he's going to use that every round, so he actually his damage is one attack higher than it is, right? And so it's all this sort of comparison. Now, in the Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, spoiler alert, uh, there is uh, an entire section on basically doing this process yourself, and we give you uh, a list of baseline numbers to compare your monster's uh, numbers to, right? Yeah. So it is, it's all... Um, it starts with a baseline derived from player numbers, and then everything is a comparison to that baseline. The nice thing, having actually used that system just earlier this week, to, so uh, I, I needed a boss monster for this bandit gang in my campaign, and so, not to brag about our game, but I mean, Rodney did all the work, so I'm bragging about his, his work, not mine. The, um, the nice thing about it was I could take a half ogre from the monster manual, and I added three levels of fighter. I could do it that way, and then look at the numbers that resulted, and then consult the table, and then get a CR. Or I could just start with the table and say, well, I want offensive CR3, defensive CR1, averages to two. So I have kind of a glass cannon and things like that. And I, I, my impression, I'm pretty happy with how the system is working, because I think we've managed to capture the third edition fiddly route, if you want to go that way, or the fourth edition, hey, I just here's the end result. I just want that route. So that was one of the big design goals yeah. we had for the system, was you can come at it from any angle you want it. Because you notice in the monster, you know, we don't have uh, monsters with class levels. But that's something you could do. All you do is just build your monster with class levels and look at its defenses and hit points and look at its attacks and damage and figure out the CR from there. Yeah, that, that is one important thing that we are making a distinction with in this edition for CR is that adding three levels of fighter to a monster might have no impact at all on its uh, strength or it might have a huge impact on it. So yeah. we can't simply say, oh, three levels of fighters, that's plus three CR. You have to always take the end yeah. result and compare it back to that initial baseline. Because what actually matters is not how you got to those numbers. What actually matters is what those numbers produce in the game. Yeah. It goes back to the level adjustment discussion we had earlier, where we're really trying to avoid these blanket, like, here's how this always works. Because everything in d and is context dependent. Adding a level of wizard to a kobold is much more potent than adding it to a storm giant. So knowing that, that right. that's a big exactly. part of the process. Cool. Do you have any more questions for our final question? Or oh, right here. I just a question. You said that you get away from like chain down the key and actually your artist. Does that mean we're going to have female characters wearing proper armor and on boot plate? Yes. Yes. No. And that, that's one of the things we're trying to do. And I, I, there might be boot plate that shows up somewhere, but we're, that is one of the things we're very like. If it's in there, it's because we made a mistake. Like we, we definitely want to have. It goes back to saying because we know we'll. we'll Women are buying games now in greater numbers than ever. So just like guys want characters, hey, I want to be that character, you know, it's that female character is there to service our female fans, not our male fans, who they can look at and go, hey, that's who I want to be. I want to be that fighter or that wizard. So yeah, that's definitely right. something we want to do. And the truth of the matter is, we think that games should be for everyone, especially D&D. &D. Uh, but you know, games are for everybody, and so we want to make sure that there is a welcoming environment here for everyone, no matter who you are, uh, you know, uh, gender, race, whatever, like we want to make sure that you feel like this is an environment that you can walk into and be comfortable playing this exactly. game. Exactly. Cool. So ready for our final question? All right, take it away. Okay, real quick before that, I just guess lecture stuff. How many of you guys plan on coming next week? Be honest, it's cool, just raise your hand. Fantastic. And how many of you guys are freshmen? Cool, thank you. Okay, jokey final question engaged. Uh, what? When is the follow-up to Tyranny of Dragons, which is a spell jammer campaign, which ends up crash landing into Rich Book or Lou's 200 page campaign setting that never got published and happening? When does that come out? I really want to know. It's a loaded question, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, the, 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 uh, it's funny because some of his setting is in Eberron. Yeah. So Eberron actually incorporated in the, the great setting search. Yeah, so there's the setting search of the, top, the three finalists. Wizards did buy those settings from the creators. They, 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 did, they were paid, they got prizes. Uh, and so there are parts, I think the undead elves in Eberron were from Rich Burlew's setting, yeah, I right. think. But I'm not positive. But yeah, so that'll come someday, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we're out. <laughs> cool. All right, well, thanks, everybody. I yeah, hope thanks this for was that. educational for you. Those are awesome questions, too. Yeah. That was really great. Thank you so much for coming out, and hopefully this was interesting. So thanks, guys. Thank you.